Hi, I'm Dave Politis from Missing 411 and the k and Missing Project. We're in Eagle County, Colorado, in the center of the Rocky Mountains, and we're just above Vail, Colorado, one of the most beautiful villages in North America. And we're here talking about the disappearance of Dr. James McGrogan. Dr. McGrogan came here on March 14th, 2014, to do a hike up to Iceman Hut, and he and three other friends started their hike very close to here and some unusual occurrences happened and Dr. McGrogan disappeared. We're going to go to that trailhead, we're going to explain the circumstances and we're going to take you up the valley through a journey and show you what the terrain looks like. So we're on the trail to Iceman Hut above Vail. And this is the location that on March 14, 2014, at about 8.30 in the morning, Dr. McGrogan and his three friends left. And they started up this fairly steep trail towards the hut. At about 10 o'clock in the morning, the men reached a location in the trail where they wanted to take a break. Dr. McGrogan, being a marathon runner, being in excellent shape, he kept going. He told the men that he'd meet them at the next stop. They were fine with that, and away he went. Now, Dr. McGrogan was carrying what's called a split snowboard. He was carrying that on his back, along with a backpack with a cell phone and a cell phone backup battery, a GPS unit, a shovel, medical supplies, and a variety of other things, including a blanket and other protective gear. He was ready for the worst. So the men followed up after McGrogan left. They went to their next spot, and he wasn't there. Well, they thought maybe he kept going, so they continued on to the, to the secondary spot. Finally, at about 5.30 at night, after they had searched for him the entire day and they couldn't locate him, one of the men went back down the mountain. And they called the Vail County Department of Public Safety, and they in turn called the Eagle County Sheriff, which started in trend a five-day search for Dr. McGrogan. Now, McGrogan was in absolutely phenomenal shape. There was a lot of snow on the ground in this area, but the trail was such that you couldn't really miss it. It was very well beaten down. It was a trail just outside of Vail that was used by hundreds of people. The snow was very compacted. You couldn't lose it. And somehow or another, he did lose it, and he wasn't, he wasn't found in that five days. They had three helicopters in the air flying over an 18 square mile area, and they didn't find anything off of the track that would indicate that somebody was hiking or skiing off the beaten track area. After five days, the weather turned bad and they called off the search. Well, it wasn't for 20 days after McGrogan disappeared that his body was found four and a half miles away through two gullies over a 12,000 foot mountain in an area that no one really expected him to be in. What we're gonna do is we're gonna go to the Booth Creek Falls Trailhead, and we'll meet you there, and we'll explain the circumstances at that point. We're at the uh, Booth Lake Trailhead and the entrance to Eagle Nest Wilderness. And up the trail here, 1.6 miles is the location where Dr. James McGrogan's body was found 20 days after he disappeared. It was found at the bottom of an ice chute at Booth Creek Falls. This location was searched previously by search and rescue teams and they found nothing. But three hikers, 20 days after he disappeared, did find his body. They called the sheriff and Vail Mountain Rescue went up and recovered the body. We're gonna show you that location now. We're at Booth Creek Falls, 9,950 feet in elevation. That's Booth Creek behind me, and this is the location where in April, 20 days after his disappearance, Dr. McGrogan was found on an ice sheet. And that's what it would have been. This would have been solid ice back in April. 
He was found wearing black leggings, a shirt, an undershirt, gray socks, no coat, no gloves, and no boots. Coat was found in his backpack along with a GPS and a phone. The interesting part behind the phone is that the phone had a backup battery and when the coroner took the phone, he turned it on and it worked. Now, where we're at right now, I have two bars in active service on my phone. And if you look at the mountain over here to my right, you'll notice that it's huge. It only makes sense that the further you went up into that mountain, you would still have phone service like I do now. So if Dr. McGrogan was alive when he came, allegedly came over the top of that mountain, why wouldn't he have used his phone all the way up and all the way down because it probably would have worked. Now they also found his ski board, snowboard, which was brought down to uh, Denver and given back to the kayak shop. We'll talk about that a little later. But at the point they found him, he was also wearing a helmet. The coroner later took off that helmet, found that he had severe head injury, he had a trauma to his left side of his chest, he had a broken femur. Other than that, he had some animal predation, which would have been normal for this area. The sorry full thing, and the thing that breaks my heart, is that this is a very, very unexplained disappearance. Many of the factors don't make any, of this, any sense. Him not wearing any boots and the boots not being found makes no sense. But if you're a reader of my other books, you'll know that many people are found without footwear, and the footwear and much of the clothing's never found. This fits much of that profile. Vail Mountain Search and Rescue are the ones that came here and eventually recovered Dr. McGrogan's body and brought him down to the coroner's office. And that's where the coroner made his determination about the various injuries that he sustained. But one of the things that's just so disturbing about this entire case is that he had a GPS and that was operational. A GPS would have shown him exactly where he was. He had a phone that was operational and could have been used. So the mysteries of these case and the issues surrounding it just continue to multiply on one another. And there are no easy answers as to what happened to the good doctor. We'll get off the mountain now. It's getting late in the afternoon and we'll pick you back up in Denver. We're off the mountain now. We're headed for Denver and we're going to attempt to locate the business that rented Dr. McGrogan his equipment. Okay, we're in downtown Denver at Confluence Kayak, the location that rented the equipment to Dr. McGrogan on his disappearance. We got permission to talk to their manager, Brian, and we're going to be going down and uh, talking to him about the circumstances of the disappearance, the equipment he rented, and just his overall perspective of what happened to Dr. McGrogan. Let's go on in and talk to him. We're here with Brian, and uh, we're talking about uh, the rental of, of Dr. McGrogan. And Brian, uh, were you here the day that uh, he rented his equipment? Yes. And can you tell me a little bit about the equipment that he did rent? Um, he came in and we rented him a split board, uh, skins for the split board, which enables him to go uphill with the board. Um, we rented him a probe, a beacon, a shovel, and a helmet um, for his trip. And of that equipment, what didn't you get back? I didn't get the probe back, uh, apparently it was uh, bent or lost or broken, and I didn't get the helmet back, and we didn't get the sheath for the, uh, for the beacon. Does that make sense to you why you didn't get that back? You know, we were told the helmet was not usable any longer, in which case, uh, after it was in the woods for 30 days with Dr. McGrogan, we kind of agreed with that. Um, we assumed that the sheath was probably cut off um, at some point, and so it was no longer usable, and the probe was a pretty you know, inexpensive piece of equipment that way. And so we really didn't, you know, spend a whole lot more thought into what we did or didn't get back. We were kind of really, uh, at that point, just really kind of happy to have a little closure to what was going on. In the history of your business and in your experience in the backcountry, have you ever heard of somebody taking that route in which you were found? No, I don't think that it's a normally used recreational route. That's a very, um, 
uh, from what I understand, it would be an extremely difficult you know, route to take. I don't think anybody would do it for training or for, for fun, uh, which is mostly why you're renting this equipment. How many days do you think it would take a normal person to make that journey from point to point? From what he did do? Yeah. I couldn't even begin to guess because again, it would never, nobody would, I don't know of anybody that would choose to go that way. Um, you know, unless you were sheer like into suffering or unless you were really trying to train for something, you know, extreme. Um, but like I said, most of the time when you're doing hot trips, you know, it's getting out with friends, it's getting out in the back country, getting away from the resorts and the crowds. And uh, um, it's, you know, it's pushing your limits a little bit with your skiing, but it's uh, also, anybody who's educated with backcountry stuff like that, you know, you don't push in that type of a way. I mean, it just wouldn't make sense to do that. So when your shop heard that he had disappeared and he had been gone for weeks, one of the things that we were doing at the same time was monitoring the search and rescue effort, which lasted five days. And at the point where he was located, one of the things that immediately struck us is that he was found without boots on. Um, I'm really baffled by that. I can't, for the life of me, understand what, you know, what would go on. Uh, of course, I've never taken a long fall, so I don't know exactly what would happen on the way down, but that seems pretty, uh, yeah, what do you say? Like, that's bizarre. Brian, thank you very much for your time. I All right. really appreciate it. Yeah, and we really, our, our thoughts and prayers, of course, go out to um, uh, Dr. McGrogan and his family. I mean, that was definitely uh, pretty serious for us here in the shop. Absolutely. Thank you. It's important to understand the complexity of Dr. McGrogan's alleged journey from location number one to where he was found at Booth Falls. He was last seen at 10 a.m. on the trail to Iceman Hut. He would have had to first gone off trail and climbed 1,296 feet to a peak with an elevation of approximately 11,000 feet. He then would have had to descend 1,000 feet into a valley that contains Middle Creek. He had to successfully cross the creek and then make a mind-numbing ascent of 1,130 feet to reach the first ridgeline containing Bald Mountain, which has an associated elevation near 12,000 feet. Finally, Dr. McGrogan would have made a treacherous descent of 1,000 feet towards a lower summit and then 1,130 feet down into Booth Falls. He allegedly did this without wearing his skis as they were found on his pack. There would have been 30-foot-plus snowdrifts throughout his journey, and there was a real hazard at multiple locations of avalanche. News organizations quoted this as a 4.5-mile trip, but they neglected to say that was 4.5 air miles. We all know that when you bushwhack through the mountains, you never hike a straight line. That's impossible. He would have been doing switchbacks as he ascended and descended. The total journey would have been 12 to 16 miles, taking multiple days.